Welcome to another episode of Raycast. I'm your host, Connor, and today we have a very exciting guest, which we will introduce in a second. But before we do that, we'll do brief introductions and then one announcement. So first we'll go to Bob, and then we'll go to Adam, who has the one announcement, and then we will introduce our guest. I'm Bob Terrio. I'm a J enthusiast, and I do some work with the J Wiki. We're underway in trying to get it all set up for the fall. I'm Adam Bolzewski, full-time APL programmer at Dialog Limited. Uh, besides for actually programming APL, uh, I also take care of all kinds of social things, including the APL wiki. And then uh, for my announcements, uh, part of what we do with Dialog is arrange a yearly user meeting or a type of conference. Um, and at that user meeting, uh, there is also a presentation by a uh, the winner of the APL problem solving competition. That competition closes in, at the end of the month. So hurry up if you want to participate. It's not too late even to get started at this point. And also at the end of the month uh, is the end of the early bird discount for the user meeting itself. Awesome. And just a note about that contest, I think, and Adam can correct me if I'm wrong, there's two phases. In the first phase, it's just 10 short problems. A lot of them are just one-liners. And even if you only solve one of the 10, I think you can win a small cash prize just from just from answering one. Is that correct? Um, I'm not even sure. You might need to solve. Uh, you might need to solve them all. But okay. They're really easy. So um, the point being though is that you don't need to complete the whole contest in order to be eligible to win prizes. No, there's, no, for sure. There's um, a certain amount that if you get to that point, you hit a certain threshold, and you can be eligible to win some some free money, which is always awesome. Um, and yeah, just briefly, uh, as as I introduce myself in every other episode, uh, I'm your host, Connor, C++ professional developer, I'm not an array language developer in my day to day, but a huge array language and combinator enthusiast at large, uh, which brings us to introducing our guest who is uh, Jeremy Howard, who has a very, very, very long career. Um, and you probably have heard him on other podcasts or have been giving other talks. I'll read the first paragraph of his th three paragraph bio because I don't want to embarrass him too much, but he has um, uh, a very accomplished career. So Jeremy Howard is a data scientist, researcher, developer, educator, and entrepreneur. Um, he is the founding researcher at Fast AI, a research institute dedicated to making deep learning more accessible and is an honorary professor at the University of Queensland, that's in Australia, I believe. Previously, Jeremy was a distinguished research scientist at the University of San Francisco, where he was the founding chair of the Wicklow Artificial Intelligence and Medical, Medical Research Initiative. Um, he's also been the CEO of Analytic and... Uh, was the president and chief scientist of Kaggle, which is the basically data science version of Leak Code, which many software developers are familiar with. He uh, was the CEO of two successful Australian startups, FastMail and Optimal Decisions Group. And before that, uh, in between doing a bunch of other things, he worked in management consulting at McKinsey, which is an incredibly interesting start to a uh, the career that he has had now. Because if for those of you that don't know, McKinsey is one of the three biggest management consulting firms alongside, I think, Bain & Co. and BCG. Um, so I'm super interested to hear how he started in management consulting and ended up you know, being the author of uh, one of the most popular uh, AI libraries in Python, and also the course that's attached to it, which I think is, if not, um, you know, the most popular, uh, a very, very popular course that students all around the world are taking. So I will stop there, throw it over to Jeremy, and he can fill in all the gaps that he wants, jump back to however far you want to, to tell us, uh, you know, how you got to where you are now. Um, and I, I think the one thing I forgot to mention, too, is that he recently tweeted on July 1st, and we're recording this on July 4th that he, he quote the tweets reads, next week, I'm starting a daily study group on my most loved programming language, APL. And uh, so obviously interested to hear more about that tweet and what's gonna be happening with that study group. So over to you, Jeremy. Well, the study group is starting today as we record this. Um, <laughs> so depending on how long it takes to get this out, it'll have just started. And um, so definitely time for people to, to to join in. Uh, so we'll, I'm sure we'll include a link to that in the show notes. Um, yeah, I definitely feel kind of like I'm your least qualified array programming person ever interviewed on this show. I, um, I love APL and J, but I've uh, done very, very little with them, particularly APL. I've done a little, little bit with J mucking around, but like, I find a couple of weeks here and there every few years, and I have for a couple of decades. Um, um, 
having said that, I am a huge enthusiast of array programming uh, as it is used, you know, in a loopless style in other languages, um, uh, initially in Perl and nowadays in Python. Um, but yeah, maybe I'll come back to that because I guess you wanted to get a sense of my background. Um, yeah, so I actually started at McKinsey. Um, I, I grew up in Melbourne, Australia, and uh, I didn't know what I wanted to do when I grew up at the point that you're meant to know when you choose a university, you know, major. So I picked philosophy on the basis that it was like, you know, the best way of punting down the road what you might do, because with philosophy, you can't do anything. Um, and honestly, that kind of worked out in that um, I needed money and I needed money to get through university. So I, I got a well, like one day a week kind of IT support job at, at McKinsey, the McKinsey Melbourne office um, during university from first year. I think that's from first year. Um, but it turned out that like, yeah, I was very curious. And so I was very curious about management consulting. So every time consultants would come down and ask me to like, you know, clean out the sticky Coke they spilt in their keyboard or whatever, I would always ask them what they were working on and ask them to show me. And I'd been really interested in like doing analytics-y kind of things for a few years at that point. So during high school, every, basically every holidays, I kind of worked on stuff with spreadsheets or Microsoft Access or whatever. So it turned out I knew more about like stuff like Microsoft Excel than they did. So within about two months of me starting this one day a week job, I was working 90 hour weeks, basically doing analytical work for the consultants. Um, and so that, you know, that actually worked out really well because uh, I kind of did a deal with them where they would, they gave me a full-time office and they would pay me $50 an hour for whatever time I needed. And so suddenly I was actually <laughs> making a lot of money, um, you know, working, working 90 hours a week. Um, and yeah, and it was great because then the I would come up with these solutions to things they're doing in the projects, and I'd have to present it to the client. So next thing I knew, I was basically on the client side all the all, all the time. So I ended up actually not going to any lectures at university, um, and I somehow kind of managed this thing where I would take two weeks off before each exam, go and talk to all my lecturers and say, "Hey, I was meant to be in your university course. I know you didn't see me, but I was kind of busy." can you tell me what I was meant to have done <laughs> and then I would do it. And so I kind of scraped by uh, a, a BA in philosophy, but I don't, yeah, you know, I don't really have much of an academic background, but that did give me a great background in like applying stuff like, you know, linear regression and logistic regression and linear programming and, you know, the basic analytical tools of the day generally through VBA scripts in Excel or, you know, access, you know, the kind of stuff that a consultant could chuck out, you know, onto their, onto their laptop at a client site. Um, anyway, I, I, I always felt guilty about doing that because it just seemed like this ridiculously nerdy thing to be doing when I was surrounded by all these very important, you know, um, consultant types who seemed to be doing much more impressive strategy work. So I tried to get away from that as quickly as I could because I didn't want to be the nerd in the company. Um, and yeah, so I ended up spending the next 10 years basically doing strategy consulting. Um, but throughout that time, I did, you know, because I didn't have the same background that they did, that the expertise they did, the MBA they did, I had to solve things using data and analytically intensive approaches. So although in theory, I was a strategy management consultant and I was working on problems like you know how do we fix the rice industry in Australia or you know how do we you know like you know how do we deal with this new competitor coming into this industry or whatever it was I always did it by analyzing data um, which actually turned out to be a good niche you know because I was the one McKinsey consultant in Australia who did things that way and so I I was successful and I became I think the I ended up moving to AT Kearney which is the other of the two original management consulting firms um, I think I became like their youngest manager in the world and you know through this 
weird parallel path I was doing. And then through that, learned about um, the insurance industry and discovered it, like the whole insurance industry was basically pricing things in a really dumb way. And I developed this approach based on um, optimization um, uh, of optimized pricing. And I launched a company uh, with my university friend who had a PhD in operations research. Um, and yeah, so we built this new approach to pricing insurance, which is, it was kind of fun. I mean, it's, um, you know, it went well in the set, you know, commercially took, you know, spent about 10 years doing, doing that. And at the same time, running an email company called Fastmail, which also went well. Um, you know, we started out basically using C++ and I would say that was kind of the start of my array programming journey in that in those days, this is like 1999, the very first expression templates based approaches to C++ numeric programming were appearing. Um, and so I, you know, was talking to the people working on those libraries doing stuff like particularly stuff doing um, the big kind of uh, high energy physics experiments that were going on in Europe. Um, it was ultimately pretty annoying to work with though, like the amount of time it took to compile those things, it would take hours and it was quirky as all hell. You know, it's still pretty quirky doing metaprogramming in C++, but in those days it was just a nightmare. Every compiler was different. So I ended up switching to C sharp shortly after that came out and, you know, move in a, in a way it was disappointing because that, that was much less expressive as a kind of array programming paradigm. And so instead I ended up uh, basically grabbing Intel's um, MKL library, um, which is basically a blast on steroids, if you like, um, and writing my own C sharp wrapper to give me you know, kind of array programming-ish capabilities, but not with any of the features one would come to expect from a real array programming language around kind of dealing with rank sensibly and, you know, not much in the way of broadcasting, um, which reminds me, we should come back to talking about BLAST at some stage, because a lot of the reasons that most languages are so disappointing at array programming is because of our reliance on, on BLAST, um, you know, as an industry. Um, I... Fastmail, on the other hand, was being written in Perl, which I really enjoyed as a programming language and still do. I still love Perl a lot. Um, but the scientific programming in Perl, I didn't love at all. Um, and so at the time, Perl 6, you know, we, was just starting to, the idea of it was being developed. So I ended up um, running the Perl 6 working group to add scientific programming capabilities or kind of, you know, and at the time I described them as APL inspired programming capabilities to Perl. And so I, I uh, did a, an RFC around what we ended up calling hyper operators, which is basically the idea that any operator can, op can operate on arrays and can broadcast over any axes that are, that are mismatched or whatever. And those RFCs all ended up getting accepted and uh, Damien Conway, and Larry Wall kind of expanded them a little bit. Um, uh, Perl 6 never exactly happened. It ended up becoming a language called Raku. Um, um, With the butterfly logo. Yeah. And that, um, you know, and the kind of the performance ideas I really worked hard on never really happened either. So that was a bit of a, yeah, that was all a bit of a failure. Um, but it was fun and it was interesting. Um, I... You know, uh, so after running these companies for 10 years, one of the big problems with running a company is that you're surrounding by people who you hired and they, you know, have to make you like them if they want to get promoted and not get fired. And so you could never trust anything anybody says. Um, so I was, you know, very, um, I had very low expectations about my capabilities analytically because I hadn't like, you know, I'd basically been running companies for 10 years. Um, I did a lot of coding and stuff, but it was in our own little whelp. And so um, after I sold those companies, um, yeah, I, I, one of the things I decided to do was to try actually to become more competent. You know, I, I had lost my 
um, to some extent, I had, I, had, I had lost my feeling that I should hide my nerdiness, you know, and try to act like a real business person. And I thought, no, I should actually see if I'm actually any good at this stuff. Um, so I tried entering a machine learning competition at a, at a new company that had just been launched called Kaggle um, with this goal of like not coming last. Um, so basically... Um, the, you know, the, the way these things work is um, you have to make predictions on a data set and at the end of the competition, whoever's predictions are the most accurate um, wins the prize. And so my goal was, yeah, try not to come last, um, which I wasn't convinced I'd be able to achieve because as I say, I didn't feel like this is, I'd never had any technical training you know, and everybody else in these competitions were PhDs and professors and whatever else. So it felt like a high bar. Anyway, I ended up winning it. Um, oh, wow. And that, that changed <laughs> my life, right? Because, yeah, it was like, um, oh, okay, I am, you know, empirically good at this thing. Um, and people at my local R uh, user groups, so we used R quite a bit as well. Um, were you know I, I told them oh, I'm going to try entering this competition anyone want to create a team with me I want to like learn to use R properly and I kind of went back to the next user group meeting and people were like I thought you were just learning this thing how did you how did you win it's like <laughs> I don't know I just used common sense um yeah, yeah, so I ended up becoming the chief scientist and president of Kaggle. And Kaggle, as you know, anybody in the data science world knows, has kind of grown into this huge, huge thing. Ended up selling it to Google. Um, so I ended up being an equal partner in the company. I was the first investor in it. Um, and that was great. That was like, I just dove in. We moved to San Francisco for 10 years, um, you know, surrounded, uh, surrounded by all these people who I just sort of role models and idols and partly getting to meet all these people in San Francisco was this experience of realizing all these people were actually totally normal, you know, and they weren't like some super genius level, like they're just normal people who, um, yeah, as I got to know them, it gave me, I guess, a lot more confidence in myself as well. So um, maybe they were just normal relative to you. <laughs> I mean, I, I think in Australia, we all feel a bit, uh, you know, intimidated by the rest of the world in some ways. We're a long way away, you know. Um, our only neighbours really are New Zealand. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's very easy to feel, I don't know, like, yeah, we, we, we're, we're not very confident of our capabilities over here other than in sport, perhaps. Um, yeah, so one of the things that happened while I was at Kaggle was I had played around with neural networks uh, a bit, a good bit, you know, like 20 years earlier. And I always felt like neural networks were one day going to be the thing. It's like, you know, they are on a theoretical, in theoretical level, infinitely capable. Um, but, you know, they never quite did it for me. And, um, but then in 2012, suddenly neural networks started achieving superhuman performance for the first time on really challenging problems like recognizing traffic signs, you know, like recognizing pictures. Um, and I had always said to myself, I was going to watch for this moment. And when it happened, I wanted to like jump on it. So as soon as I saw that, I tried to jump on it. So I started a new company after a year of research um, into like the, you know, what, what a neural network's going to do. I decided medicine was going to be huge. I knew nothing about medicine. <laughs> and I, yeah, I started a medicine company to see what we could do with deep learning in medicine. Um, so that was analytic. Um, yeah, that ended up, ended up going pretty well. And um, yeah, eventually I kind of got like a bit frustrated with that though, because it felt like Deep learning can do so many things and I'm only doing such a small part of those things. Um, so deep learning is like neural networks with multiple layers. Um, I thought the only way to actually help people really, you know, make the most of this incredibly valuable technology is to teach other people how to do it and to help other people to do it. 
so my wife and I ended up starting a new, I'd call it kind of a research lab, uh, fast AI, to um, to help to help do that basically. Initially, focus on education, and then increasingly focus on research and software development to basically make it easier for folks to use um, deep learning. And that's yeah, that's where I am now. And that everything in deep learning is all Python. And in Python, we're very lucky to have, uh, you know, uh, excellent libraries that behave pretty consistently with each other, basically based around this um, NumPy library, which um, treats arrays very, very similarly to how um, J does, um, except rather than leading axis, it's trailing axis. But basically you get, you know, you, do, you get loop free, you get broadcasting, you know, you don't get things like a rank conjunction, but there's very easy ways to permute axes. So you can do basically the same thing. Uh, things like Einstein notation, you know, the are, are built into the libraries. And then, you know, it's, it's trivially easy to have them run on GPUs or TPUs or whatever, you know. So it's, for the last few years of my life, nearly all the code I write is array programming code, even though I'm not using a purely array language. All right, so where do we start now with the questions? Uh, <laughs> I'll let Bob and Adam go first if they want. And uh, if, they, if they don't have, a, okay, Bob, you go ahead. I've got a quick question about, uh, about neural networks and stuff, because mm -hmm. when I was going to university all those years ago, people were talking about neural networks and then they just sort of dropped off the face. And as you said, around 2010, suddenly they resurfaced again. Uh, what do you think yeah. was the cause of that resurfacing? Was it hardware? Was it somebody discovered a new method or what? Yeah, mainly hardware. Um, so what happened was people figured out how to do GP, GPU. So general purpose GPU computing. Um, so before that, I tried a few times to use GPUs for neural nets. I felt like that would be the thing. But GPUs were all about like creating shaders and whatever. And I, it, it was a whole jargon thing. I didn't even understand what was going on. So uh, the key thing was NVIDIA coming up with this uh, CUDA um, uh, approach, which it's, it's all loops, right? But it's much easier than the old way. Like the loops, you basically, it, it, it's kind of loops. At least you basically say to, to CUDA, this is my kernel, which is the piece of code I want to basically run on each symmetric multiprocessing unit. And then you basically say, launch a bunch of threads uh, and it's going to call your kernel, you know, basically incrementing the X and Y coordinates and passing it to your kernel or making them available to your kernel. So it's a kind of, it's not exactly a loop, but it's this, it's more like a map, I guess. Um, and so when CUDA appeared, yeah, uh, very quickly, um, neural network libraries appeared to take advantage, appear, appeared that would take advantage of it. And then suddenly, you know, you get orders of magnitude more performance uh, and it's cheaper. And you get to buy an NVIDIA graphics card with a free copy of Batman, you know, on the excuse that actually this is all for work. So it's, it, it, was, it was mainly that. Um, there's also this just like at the same time, the thing I'd been doing for 25 years suddenly got a name, data science. You know, we like there's this very small industry of people like applying data-driven approaches to solving business problems. And we were always looking for a name. Um, not many people know this, but back in the very early days, there was an attempt at calling it industrial mathematics. Sometimes people would like shoehorn it into operations research or management science, but that was almost exclusively optimization people and specifically people focused more on linear programming approaches. So yeah, once data science appeared and also like, you know, basically every company had finally built their data warehouse and the data was, was there. Um, so yeah, it was like a more awareness of using data to solve business problems and for the first time availability of the hardware that we actually needed. Uh, and as I say, in 2012, it just, it's, it, it reached the point, like it'd been growing since the first neural network was built in, what was that, 1957, I guess, um, at this kind of gradual rate. But once it passed human performance on some tasks, 
it just kept going. And so now in the last couple of months, you know, it's now like getting decent marks on MIT math tests and stuff. It's, it's, um, it's on an amazing trajectory. Yeah, it's kind of a critical mass kind of thing. You get a certain amount of information and it's able to process that information. It, I guess, as you as you you know, do with your hand, it's an exponential curve. And yeah. humans and exponential curves, I think we're finding over and over again, we're not really great at at understanding an exponential no. curve. No, we're not. And that's like why I promised myself that as soon as I saw neural nets starting to look like they're doing interesting things, I would drop everything and, and jump on it because I wanted to jump on that curve as early as possible. And we're now in this situation where people are just making huge amounts of money with neural nets, which they then reinvest back into making the neural nets better. Um, and so we are also seeing this kind of bifurcation of capabilities where there's a small number of organizations who are extremely good at this stuff and have invested in it and a lot of organizations that are you know really struggling to figure it out and because of the exponential nature when it happens it happens very quickly it feels mm-hmm. like you didn't see it coming and suddenly it's there and then it was past you mm-hmm. and i think yeah. we're all experiencing that now yeah and it's happened in so many industries you know um uh back in my medical startup uh you know we were interviewing folks uh, around medicines. We interviewed a guy finishing his PhD in um, histopathology. And I remember he, you know, he came in to do an interview with us and he basically gave us a presentation about his thesis on kind of graph cut segmentation approaches for pathology slides. And at the end, he was like, anyway, that was my PhD. And then yesterday, because I knew I was coming to see you guys and I heard you like neural nets, I just thought I'd check out neural nets. And about four hours later, I trained a neural net to do the same thing I did for my PhD. And it way outperformed my PhD thesis I'd spent the last five years on. And so that's where I'm at, you know, (laughs) and we hear this a lot. Existential crisis in the middle of an interview. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) So I I kind of have, I don't know, this is like a one A, B and C, um, and uh, I'm not sure if I should ask them all at once. Um, but so you said sort of at the tail end of the 90s is when your array language journey started. But it seems from the way you explained it that you had already at some point along the way heard about the array languages, APL and J, and have sort of alluded to, you know, picking up some knowledge about the paradigm and the languages. So I, my first part of the question is sort of, you know, at what point were you exposed to um the paradigm in these languages the second part is what what's causing you in 2022 to you know really dive into it because you, you said you feel like uh, maybe a bit of an imposter or you're the least qualified guest uh, which probably is you just being very modest i'm sure you you know still quite a bit and then the third part is do you have thoughts about and i've always sort of wondered how the array language paradigm sort of missed out on like and python ended up being the main data science language um, while like there's like an article that's floating around online called NumPy, uh, the ghost of Iverson, um, which it's, it's this sort of, you can see that in the names and, and the design of the library that there is a core of APL and even the documentation um, acknowledges that it took inspiration greatly from J and APL. Um, but that like the array languages clearly missed, missed what was a golden opportunity for their paradigm um, and and we ended up with libraries and other languages. So I, I just asked three questions at once. Sure. Yeah, feel free to I tackle have, them in any order. <laughs> I have a pretty bad memory, so I'll um, I think I've forgotten the second one already. So you can feel free to come back to any or all of them. So my journey, which is what you started with, um, was um, I always felt like we should do more stuff without using code. Um, because I, um, or at least like kind of traditional, what I guess we'd call nowadays imperative code. Um, I, I, there was a couple of tools in, in, in my early days, which I've got huge amounts of leverage from because nobody else in, in at least the consulting firms or generally in our clients knew about them. Now that was SQL and pivot tables. 
And so pivot tables, if you haven't come across it, was basically the one of the earliest approaches to, to OLAP, you know, slicing and dicing. There was actually something slightly earlier called Lotus Improv, but that was actually a separate product. Excel was basically the first one to put OLAP in the spreadsheet. So no loops, you just drag and drop the things you want to group by and you right click to choose how to summarize. And same with SQL, you know, um, uh, you declaratively say what you want to do. You don't have to loop through things. Um, SAS actually had something similar, you know, with SAS, you could basically de declare a prop that would run on your data. So yeah, I kind of felt like this was the way I would rather do stuff if I could. Um, and I think that's what led me when we started doing the C++ implementation of the insurance pricing stuff of being much more drawn to these metaprogramming approaches. Uh, I just didn't want to be writing loops in loops and dealing with all that stuff. It just, I'm, I'm too lazy, you know, to, to do that. I think I'm very driven by laziness, um, which as Larry Wall said is one of the three virtues of a great programmer. Um, then, yeah, so I, I think when, as soon as I saw NumPy had reached a level of some, you know, reasonable competence in Python, I was very drawn to that because it was what I was been looking for. And I think maybe that actually is going to bring us to answering the question of like what happened to array languages. Um, Python has a lot of problems, um, but at its heart, it's a very well-designed language. It has a very small, flexible core. Um, personally, I don't like the way most people write it, but I've but it's so flexible, I've been able to create, create my, almost my own version of Python, um, which is very functionally oriented. I basically have stolen the type dispatch ideas from Julia, created an implementation of that in Python. Um, you, know, I, I, you know, my Python code doesn't look like most Python code, um, but I can use all the stuff that's, that's in Python. So there's this very nicely designed core of a language, which I then have this, almost this DSL, on top of, you know, and NumPy is able to create this kind of DSL again, because it's um, working on such a flexible um, foundation. Um, ideally, you know, I mean, it, it, well, okay. So Python also has another DSL built into it, which is math. You know, I can use the operators plus times minus and that's, that's convenient. And in every array library, NumPy, PyTorch, TensorFlow and Python, those operators work over arrays and do broadcasting over axes and so forth and, you know, accelerate on an accelerator like a GPU or a TPU. That's all great. I, you know, my ideal world would be that I, I wouldn't just get to use plus times and minus, but I'd get to use all the APL symbols. You know, that would be, that would be amazing. But given a choice between a really beautiful language, you know, at its core, like Python, in which I can then add a slightly cobbled together DSL like NumPy, I would much prefer that over a really beautiful notation like APL, but without the fantastic language underneath. You know, like I, I don't feel like I, I there's there's nothing about APL or J or J or K's like programming language that attracts me, do you know what I mean? I feel like in terms of like what I could do around, around whether it be type dispatch or, or how OO is designed or, you know, how I package modules or almost anything else, I would prefer the Python way. So I feel like um, that's, that's basically what we've ended up with. You, you kind of either compromise between, you know, a good language with you know, slightly substandard notation or amazingly great notation with the substandard language, um, uh, or not just language, but ecosystem. ecosystem you know, yeah, I, was the Python has an amazing ecosystem. Yeah. Um, I think, I, I hope one day we'll get the best of both, right? Like, here's my, okay, here's my controversial take, and it may just represent my lack of knowledge. Um, uh, what I like about APL is its notation. Uh, I think it's a, it's a beautiful notation. I, I don't think it's a beautiful programming language. Um, I think some things 
possibly everything, you know, but some things work very well as a notation. Um, but to get to get to raise something to the point that it is a notation requires some years of study and development and often some genius, you know, like the genius of Feynman diagrams or the genius of juggling notation, you know, like there are people who, who find a way to turn a field into a notation and suddenly they, they blow that field apart and make it better for everybody. For me, like, I don't want to think too hard all the time. Every time I come across something that really hasn't been turned into, no, into a notation yet, you know, sometimes I just like, I just want to get it done, you know? And so I would rather only use notation when I'm in these fields that either somebody else had fi figured out how to make that a notation, um, or I feel like it's really worth me investing to figure that out. Um, otherwise, you know, there are, and, and the other thing I'd say is we already have notations for things that aren't APL that actually work really well, like regular expressions, for example, that's, that's a fantastic notation. And I don't want to replace that with APL glyphs. I just want to use regular expressions. Um, so yeah, my ideal world would be one where we, where I can write PyTorch code but maybe instead of like Einstein operations, uh, Einstein notation, I could use APL notation. Um, that that I think that's where I would love to get to one day, and I would and I would love that to totally transparently run on a GPU or TPU as well. Um, that would be that would wouldn't be my all, wouldn't we happy all. place. Has no reason to do with the fact that I work at Nvidia that I would love that, but. Uh... <laughs> Um, interesting. I've never heard that before. The difference between, um, basically appreciating or being in love with the notation, but not, not the language itself. And that mm -hmm. Python and, you know, is... it started out as a notation, right? Like Iverson talked, you know, it was a notation they used for representing state machines or whatever on the early IBM hardware, you know, it, it, when he did his Turing award essay, he chose to talk about his notation um and you know you see with people like 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 aaron with with his code and stuff that if you take a very smart person and give them a few years they can use that notation to solve incredibly challenging problems like build a compiler um and do it better than you can without that notation um so i'm not saying like yeah apl can't be used for almost anything you want to use it for. But a lot of the time we don't have five years to study something very closely. We just want to, you know, we've got to get something done by tomorrow. Interesting. We still didn't get, the, didn't get a answer to- Oh yeah, when did, when did you first, well, when did you first meet APL or how did you even find the APL? Uh, I first found Jay, I think. Um, which obviously led me to APL, and I don't quite remember where I saw it. Um, yeah, um, and actually, when I got to San Francisco, so that would be, I'm trying to remember, 2010 or something, I'm not sure. Um, I actually reached out to Eric Iverson and I said, like, oh, you know, we're, we're starting this machine learning company called Kaggle. And I kind of feel like, you know, everybody does stuff in Python and it's kind of in a lot of ways really disappointing. I wish we we're doing stuff in J, you know, but we really need everything to be running on the, the, the GPU or at least everything to be automatically using SIMD and multiprocessor everywhere. Um, he was kind enough to actually jump on a Skype call with me, not just jump on a Skype call, but he was like, how do you want to chat? And it's like, how about Skype? And he created a Skype account and <laughs> chatted and like, oh, and yeah, we chatted for quite a while. I, 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 we talked about, you know, these, these, these kinds of hopes and, um, um, yeah, but I just, you know, never really, because, because neither J or APO is in that space yet there was just never a reason for me to do anything other than like 
it kind of felt like each time I'd have a bit of a break for a couple of months, I'd always spend a couple of weeks fiddling around with Jay just for fun. Um, but that's that's as far as I got, really. Yeah, I think the first time I'd heard of you was an, in an interview that Leo Laporte did with you on triangulation, and you were talking about Kaggle. That was a specific thing. But I'm, I think I was riding my bike along some logging road or something, and suddenly he said, oh, yeah, but a lot of people use Jay. I like Jay. It's the first time I'd ever heard anybody on a podcast say anything about Jay. It was just like, wow, that's amazing. I didn't know what, you know, like, and and the whole interview about Kaggle, there was so much of it about uh, the importance of data processing, not just having a lot of data, but knowing how to filter it down, not over filtering, all those tricks. I'm thinking, wow, these guys are really doing some deep stuff with this stuff, and this guy is using Jay. Um, I was... I actually very surprised at that point that somebody, I guess not that somebody who was, who was working so much with data would know about Jay, but just that it would be, I guess, just suddenly popped onto my headsets and I'm just, wow, yeah. that's so neat. And I will say like, in the array programming community, I find there's like, there seems to be a common misconception that like, the reason people aren't using array programming languages is because they don't know about them or don't understand them, you know, um, which there's a kernel of truth of that. But the, 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 the truth is like nowadays there's huge, massively funded research labs at places like Google brain and, you know, Facebook AI research and open AI and so forth, where, large teams of people are literally writing new programming languages because they've tried everything else and what's out there is not sufficient. You know, um, I, I find there's, you know, in the array programming world, there's a, a often a huge kind of underappreciation of what Python can do nowadays, for example. Like I, I, as recently as last week, I heard it described in a chat room as like, people obviously don't care about performance because they're using Python. Um, and it's like, well, you know, a large amount of the world's highest performance computing now is done with Python. Like it's, yeah. it's, it's not because Python's fast. It's because like, but if you want to use Rapids, for example, which literally holds records for the highest performance, you know, recommendation systems and tabular analysis, you write it in Python, you know, um, that's, you know, so this idea of having um, a, a fast kernel that's not written in the language and then something else talking to it in a very flexible way, I think is, is great. And as I say, at the moment, we are very hamstrung in a lot of ways that we, or at least until recently, we very heavily relied on, on BLAS, which um, is totally the wrong thing for that kind of flexible high performance computing. Cause it's this, you know, bunch of somewhat arbitrary kind of selection of linear algebra algorithms, which, you know, things like the C-sharp work I did, you know, they were just wrappers on top of, of BLAS. And what we really want is a way to write really expressive kernels that can do anything over any axes. Um, so then there are other newer uh, approaches like um, Julia, for example, which um, is, uh, it's kind of like got some lispy elements to it and this type dispatch system. But because it's, um, um, you know, in the end, it's on top of LLVM, what you write in Julia, you know, it, 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 it does end up getting optimized very well. And you can write pretty much arbitrary kernels in Julia and often get best in class performance. And then there's other approaches like um, JAX, and JAX um, sits on top of something totally different, which is it sits on top of XLA. And XLA is a, a, a compiler, which is mainly designed to compile things to run fast on Google's TPUs, um, but it uh, also does an okay job of compiling things to run on, on GPUs. Um, and then really excitingly, I think, you know, for, for me is uh, the, the MLIR, um, um, project and particularly the, the affine dialect. So that was created by my friend, Chris Latner, who you probably know from creating um, uh, Clang and LLVM and Swift. Um, uh, so he, he joined Google for a couple of years and we worked really closely together on trying to like think about the vision of, of 
really powerful programming on accelerators that's really developer friendly. Um, unfortunately, didn't work out. Google was a bit too tied to, to the TensorFlow. Um, but one of the big ideas that did come out of that was MLIR, and that's still going strong. And I do think there's, you know, if, if something like APL, you know, could to target MLIR and then become a DSL inside Python, it may yet win, you know. I've heard, yeah, I've heard you in the past say that um, on different podcasts and talks that you don't think that Python, like even in in light of, you know, just saying people don't realize how much you can get done with Python, that you don't think that the future of data science and AI and neural networks and that type of computation um, is going to live in the Python ecosystem. And I've, I've heard on some podcasts, you've said that, you know, Swift has a shot based on sort of the way that they've designed that language. And you just mentioned, a, a, you know, a plethora of different sort of I wouldn't say initiatives, but you know, Jax, XLA, Julia, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Do you have like a sense of where you where you think the future of um, not necessarily sort of array language computation, but this this kind of computation is going with yeah. all, the, all the different avenues? I do. Um, you know, I think we're certainly seeing the limitations of Python um, and the limitations of the the PyTorch. You know. Um, lazy evaluation model, which is um, the way most things are done in Python at the moment for a kind of array programming is you, you have an expression which is you know working on arrays possibly of different ranks with implicit looping. And you know that's one line of Python code. And generally that then gets uh, your you know on your computer that'll get turned into you know, a, a request to run some particular optimized pre-written operation on the GPU or TPU, that then gets sent off to the GPU or TPU um, where your data has already been moved there. Um, it runs and then it tells the CPU when it's finished. And there's a lot of latency in this, right? So if you want to create your own kernel, like your own way of doing you know, your own operation effectively, um, you know, good luck with that. That's not going to happen in Python. And um, I hate this. I hate it as a teacher because, you know, I can't show my students what's going on, right? It kind of goes off into, you know, kind of uh, CUDA land and then comes back later. Um, I, I hate it as a hacker because I can't go in and hack at that. I can't mm. trace it. I can't debug it. I can't easily profile it. Um, I hate it as a researcher because very often I'm like, I know we need to change this thing in this way, but I'm damned if I'm going to go and write my own CUDA code, let alone deploy it. So um, JAX is, I think, a path to this. It's where you say, okay, let's not target pre-written CUDA things. Let's instead target um, a compiler. And, you know, working with Chris Latner, I'd say he didn't have too many nice things to say as about XLA as a compiler. It was not written by compiler writers. It was written by machine learning people, really. Um, but it, it, it does the job, you know, and it's certainly better than having no compiler. And so JAX is something which instead of turning our line of Python code into a call to some pre-written operation, it instead is turning it into something that's going to be read by a compiler. And so the compiler can then, you know, optimize that as compilers do. So yeah, I would guess that JAX probably has a, a part to play here, um, particularly because you get to benefit from the whole Python ecosystem, package management, libraries, you know, visualization tools, et cetera. Um, but, you know, longer term, it's a mess, you know, it's a mess using a language like Python, which wasn't designed for this. Um, it wasn't really even designed as something that you can chuck different compilers on, onto. So people put horrible hacks. So for example, PyTorch, they have something called TorchScript, which is a bit similar. You know, it takes Python and kind of compiles it, but they literally wrote their own parser using a bunch of regular expressions. And it's, it's you know, it's, not very good at what it does. It even misreads comments and stuff. Um, so, I, you know, I do think there's definitely room for, um, you know, a, a language of which Julia would certainly be the leading contender at the moment um, to come in and 
do it properly. And Julia's got, you know, Julia is written on a scheme um, basis. So there's this little scheme kernel that does the parsing and whatnot. And then pretty much everything else after that is written in Julia. Um, and of course, leveraging LLVM very heavily. But that's, I think that's what we want, right? Is that something which, I guess something also I didn't love about Swift when, when the team at Google wanted to add differentiation support into Swift, they wrote it in C++. And I was just like, that's not a good sign. <laughs> uh, you know, like apart from anything else, you end up with this, a group of developers who are in theory, Swift experts, but they actually write everything in C++. And so they actually don't have much feel for what it's like to write stuff in Swift. They're writing stuff for Swift. In Julia, pretty much everybody who's writing stuff for Julia is writing stuff in Julia. Um, and I think that's that's something you guys have talked about around APL and J as, as, as well, is that there's the idea of writing J things in J and APL things in APL is a very powerful idea. Yeah, I always wonder about... Oh. Yeah, sorry, go on. I just remembered your third question. I'll come back to it. No, 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 you go ahead, you go ahead. Oh, you asked me why now am I coming back to APL and G, which is um, totally orthogonal to everything else we've talked about, which is I had a daughter. She got old enough to actually start learning math, so she's six. Um, and, um, oh, my God, there's so many great educational apps nowadays. There's one called Dragonbox Algebra. It's so much fun. Dragonbox Algebra 5 Plus. And it's like, 5 Plus Algebra? Like, what the hell? So when she's, I think actually she's still four, I gave, you know, I let her play with Dragonbox Algebra 5 Plus. And she learned algebra, you know, by helping dragon eggs hatch. Um, and she liked it so much, I let her try doing Dragonbox Algebra 12 Plus. And it, she loved that as well and, and finished it. And so suddenly I had a five-year-old kid that liked algebra. <laughs> um, <laughs> much to my surprise. Um, kids really can surprise you. Uh, uh, and so, yeah, she struggled with a lot of the math that they were meant to be doing at primary school, like, like division and multiplication, but she liked algebra. <laughs> and uh, we ended up homeschooling her. And then one of our... Uh, her best friend is also homeschooled. So this this year I decided I'd try tutoring them in math together. And um, uh, so my daughter's name's Claire. So her friend Gabe, uh, so her friend Gabe um, discovered on his Mac the world of alternative keyboards. So he would start typing in the chat in, you know, Greek characters or Russian characters. And one day I was like, okay, check this out. So I like typed in some APL characters. And they were just like, oh, wow, what's that? We need that. <laughs> so initially we installed Dialog APL so that they could type APL characters in, in the chat. Um, and so I explained to them that this is actually this, like super fancy math that you're typing in. And they really wanted to, to try it. So, um, and that was at the time I was trying to teach them sequences and series. And they were not getting it at all. It was my first total failure time as a as a math tutor with them. You know, they'd been zipping along fractions, you know, greatest common denominator, factor trees. Okay, everything's fine, it makes sense. And then we hit sequences and series, and it's just like they had no idea what I was talking about. So we put that aside, then we spent like three one-hour lessons doing the basics of APL, you know, uh, the basic operations and doing stuff with lists and dyadic versus monadic. Um, but still, you know, just primary school level math. Um, and then we also did the same thing in NumPy using Jupyter. And they really enjoyed all that. Like they were more engaged than our normal lessons. And so then we came back to like, you know, sigma i equals one to five of i squared, whatever. And I was like, okay, that means this, you know, in APO and this in NumPy. And they're like, oh, is that all? <laughs> Fine. But, you know, that's like, yeah. So that was the problem. This idea of like Tn equals Tn minus one plus blah, blah. It's like, 
what is this stuff? But when you're actually indexing real things and can print out the intermediate values and all that, and you've got IOTA or A range, they were just like, oh, okay. Uh, which, you know, I don't know why you explained it this dumb way before. And I will say, given a choice between doing something on a whiteboard or doing something in NumPy or doing something in APO, now they will always pick APO because the APO version is just so much easier. You know, there's less mm-hmm. to type, there's less to think about, there's less boilerplate. Um, and so it's, been, it's only been a few weeks, but like yesterday we did the power operator. You know, and so we literally started doing the foundations of metamathematics. Uh, metamathematics. So I was like, okay, we, let's create a function called capital S, capital S arrow, you know, um, plus jot one, right? So for those Python people listening, jot is um, if you give it a, um, uh, a an array or a scalar, it's the same as partial in in um, in uh, Python or bind in C plus plus. Um, so, okay, we've now got something that adds one to things. Okay, I said, oh, okay, this is called the successor function. And so I said to them, okay, what would happen if we go S, 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 zero? And they're like, mm, oh, that would be three. And so I said, okay, well, what's it, what's addition? And then one of them's like, oh, it's, it's repeated S. And I'm like, yeah, it's repeated S. So how do we say repeated? So in APO, we say repeated by using this star diuresis. It's called power. Okay, so now we've done that what is multiplication? And then one of them goes after a while, oh, it's repeated addition. So we define addition and then we define multiplication. And then I'm like, okay, well, what about, you know, exponent? Oh, that's just, now this one they've heard a thousand times. They're both heard immediately like, oh, that's repeated multiplication. So like, okay, we've now defined that. And then, okay, well, subtraction, that's a bit tricky. Well, it turns out that subtraction is just, you know, is the opposite of something. What's it the opposite of? They both know like, oh, that's the opposite of addition. Okay, well, opposite of, which in math we call inverse, is just a negative power. So now we define subtraction. So how would you define division? Oh, okay, how would you define roots? Oh, okay. So we kind of like, you know, designing the foundations of, of mathematics here at APL, um, you know, with a six-year-old and an eight-year-old and during this whole thing, at one point, we're like, okay, well, now I can't remember why, but we're like, okay, now we've got to do one divided by a half. And they're both like, we don't know how to do that. <laughs> so, you know, with APL, this stuff that's considered like college level math suddenly becomes easy. And, you know, at a point when still primary school level math, like one divided by a half is still <laughs> considered hard. So it's definitely made me rethink, you know, um, what is easy and what is hard and how to teach this math stuff. And so I've been doing a lot of teaching of math with APO and the kids are loving it and I'm loving it. And that's actually why I started this study group, which will be on today. Um, today, as we record this a few days ago, as you put it out there, um, as I kind of started saying on Twitter to people like, oh, it's really been fun teaching my kids, you know, my kid and her friend math using APO and a lot of, Adults were like, uh, can we learn math using APL as well? <laughs> so, so that's what we're going to do. Well, and that's the whole notation thing, isn't it? It's the uh-huh. notation. You get away from the sigmas and the pies and all that, you know, subscripts. I know, right? And, this and, is exactly yeah. what Everson wanted. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, who wants this, you know, why should capital pi be product and capital sigma yeah. be sum? It's like... You know, we did plus slash, and then it's like, okay, how do we do product? And they're like, oh, it's obviously time slash. And I show them backslash, and like, how do we do a cumulative product? And so oh, it's obviously times backslash. Yeah, this stuff. And, but, you know, a large group of adults can't, can't handle this because I'll put stuff on Twitter. I'll be like, here's a cool thing in APL. And like half the replies will be like, well, that's line noise. That's not intuitive. It's like, how do you it's this classic that? thing that uh, it's this <laughs> classic thing that Iverson always said. It's like the difference between what you is it that you don't understand it or is it that it's hard? Um, and you know, kids don't know. You know, for kids, everything's new. So that you know, if they see something they've never seen before, they're just like, "Teach me that." Whereas adults, or at least a good chunk of adults, are just like, "I don't immediately understand that. Therefore, it's too hard for me. Therefore, I'm gonna belittle the very idea of the thing." 
I did a, I did a tacit program on one liner on APL farm the other day, and somebody said that looks like Greek to me. I said, well, Greek looks like Greek to me because I don't know Greek. Right. <laughs> I mean, sure, if you don't know it, absolutely, it looks silly. But yeah. if you know it, then it's it's not that hard. Yeah, I will say, like, you know, a lot of people have put a lot of hard work into resources for APL and J teaching, but I, I think there's still a long way to go. Um, and uh, one of the challenges is, it's like when I was learning Chinese, um, I really wanted to, I, I liked the idea of learning Chinese new words by looking them up in a Chinese dictionary. But of course, I didn't know what the characters in the dictionary meant, so I couldn't look them up. So when I learned Chinese, I really spent the first 18 months just focused on learning characters. So I got through 6,000 characters in 18 months of very hard work. And then I could start looking things up in dictionary. My hope is to do a similar thing for APO, like for these study groups. I want to try to find a way to introduce every glyph in an order that never refers to glyphs you haven't learned yet. Um, like that's something I don't feel like we really have. And so that then you can look up stuff in the dialogue documentation because now still I don't know that many glyphs. Um, so like most of the stuff in the documentation I don't understand because it explains glyphs using glyphs I don't yet know. And then I look those up and those are used, explain things with glyphs I don't yet know. So, you know, step one for me is I think we're just going to go in through and try to teach what every glyph is. And then I feel like we should be able to study this better together because then we can actually read the documentation, you know. Are you going to publish these sessions online? Yeah. Yeah, so the, the 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 study group will be recorded as videos, um, uh, but I also then want to actually create, you know, written materials using Jupyter, which I will then publish. That's my goal. So what you said very much resonates with me, that I often find myself in a, uh, when teaching people this, this bind, that to explain everything, I need to already have everything explained. Mm. Um, and I think... So, and, and especially it comes down to, in order to explain what many of these glyphs are doing, I need some fancy arrays. If I restrict myself to simple vectors and the scalars, then I can't really show their power. And I cannot create these higher rank arrays without already using those glyphs. And so right. hopefully, uh, it was this long running project since like 2015, I think it is, uh, is to add a literal array notation to APL. Right. Um, and, and then there is a way in. Then you can start by looking at what is an array and then you can start yeah. manipulating and see the effects of the glyphs and intuit from there what they do. Yeah, and no, I think that'll be very, very helpful. And in the meantime, you know, my approach with the kids has just been to teach Rho quite early on. Right. So Rho is the equivalent of uh, reshape in um, Python, most Python libraries. Um, and yeah, so once you know how to reshape, you can start with a vector and shape it to anything you like. And it's, you know, it's not a difficult concept to understand. So I think that, yeah, basically the trick at the moment is just to say, okay, in our learning of the dictionary of APL, one of the first things we will learn is, is row. And then it was really fun with the kids doing monadic row, you know, um, to be like, okay, well, what's row of this? And what's row of that? And okay, what's row of row of this? And then what's row of row of row, which then, led me to the um to the Stormen um uh poem about uh what is it row 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 is one <laughs> et cetera et cetera which uh they loved as well yeah we'll link that in the show notes um also too while you were saying all that uh that really resonated me with me when I first started learning APL is uh like one of the first things that happened when I was like oh okay you can um you can fold, you can map. So like, how do you filter, you know, what are the classic, you know, three functional things. And the, the problem with APL and array languages is they don't have an equivalent filter that takes a predicate function. They have a filter that is called compress that takes a mask that, you know, drops anything that corresponds to a zero. And it wasn't until a few months later that I ended up discovering it, but for both APL and the newer APL BQN, there's these two sites Adam was the one that wrote um, the APL one, uh, applecart.info and baconcrate.info, I also think. And so you can basically semantically search for what you're trying to do, and it'll give you small expressions that do that. 
Uh, so if you type in the word filter, um, which is what you would call it coming from, you know, a functional language, or even I think Python calls it a uh, filter, you can get a list of small expressions. And um, really, really often, sometimes you need to know the exact thing uh, that it's called. Like one time I was searching for, you know, all the combinations or permutations. And really what I was looking for was power set. And so until you have that, you know, the word power set, um, you, it's, you know, it's a, it's a fuzzy search, right? So, but it, it's still a very, very useful tool when it's like you said, you're trying to learn something like Chinese and it's like, well, where do I even start? I don't, I don't know the language to search, uh, the words to search for. Um, but yeah, it is, I, I agree that there's a, a, a large room for improvement and how to onboard people without them immediately going, like you said, this looks like hieroglyphics, which I think Iverson considered a compliment. Like I, there's some anecdote I've heard where someone was like, this is hieroglyphics. And he says, yes, exactly. <laughs> and then they I both think just- the other thing like that I want to do is um, help in particular Python programmers and maybe also do something for JavaScript programmers, which are the two most popular languages. Like at the moment, like a lot of the tutorials for stuff like J or whatever, like J for C programmers, you know, great book, but most people aren't C programmers. And also a lot of the stuff like, you know, it'd be so much easier if somebody just like said to me early on, oh, you know, Jot's just the same as partial in Python, you know, mm -hmm. or um, it's like, you know, putting things in a box, what the hell's a box? If somebody basically said, oh, it's basically the same as a reference. And it's like, oh, okay. You know, I think in one of your podcasts, somebody said, oh, it's like Void Star. It's like, oh, yeah, okay. You know, there's this kind of like lack of um, just saying like, this is actually the same thing as blah in, in Python and JavaScript. So I do want to do some kind of, uh, yeah, mapping yeah. like that, um, particularly for kind of NumPy programmers and stuff, because a lot of it's so extremely similar. Um, uh, it'd be nice to kind of say like, okay, well, this is, you know, J maps things over leading axes, which is exactly the same as NumPy, except it does it over trailing axes. So if you know the NumPy rules, you basically know the, the J rules. Yeah, I think I think at the basic level, you're absolutely right. And that, that would certainly be really useful. When we've talked this over before, some of the challenges are in the flavors and the details. If you send somebody down the wrong road with a metaphor that almost works in some of these areas, it can really be challenging for them because it, it, they see it in with, you know, through their lens of their experience. But that would say, in this area, it would work differently than it actually does. So there is a challenge in that, and we find it even between APL, BQN, and J. Um, I'm trying to think of what we were talking about recently. Oh, it was transpose. Dyadic transpose, the, lang yeah. the languages, dyadic transposes, they, hand they handle them differently. They're, functionally, you can do the same things, but you have to be aware that they are going to do it differently according to the language. Absolutely. But that's not a reason to throw out the analogy, right? Like, no, I think no. everybody agrees that that it's easier for an APL programmer to learn J than for a C or JavaScript programmer to learn J, yeah, you know, because there are, there are some ideas you understand and you can actually say to people like, okay, well, this is the rank conjunction in J and you may recognize this as being like the rank, you know, operator in APL. So if we can do something like that and say like, oh, well, okay, this is, you know, this would do the same thing as, you know, uh, dot permute, um, dot blah in, in PyTorch. It's like, okay, I, yeah. I see it. Well, as the maintainer of Apple Cart, I'd like to throw in a little call to the, to the listeners. Uh, like what Connor mentioned, uh, I do fairly often get people saying, well, I couldn't find this and this. And I ask them, what did you search for? So do let me know, contact me by whatever means and say, if you couldn't find something, either because it's altogether missing and I might be able to edit um, or tell me what you searched for and couldn't find or maybe you found it later by searching for something else. And I'll add those keyword, keywords for future users. Um, and I have put in a lot of like function names from other uh, programming languages so that you can search for those and find the APL equivalent. Yeah, um, I will say, I feel like either I'm not smart enough to use applecart.info or I haven't got the right tutorial yet. Cause I, I went there, I've been there a few times and there's this like whole lot of like impressive looking stuff. And I just, I, I don't want to know what to do with it. And then I sometimes click things and it sends me over to this tio.run that tells me like real time 0.02 seconds code. Like I find it um, 
you know, a little, uh, I mean, not a little, I, I have not yet, I don't yet know how to use it. Um, and so, you know, I, I guess given hearing you guys say this is a really useful tool that a lot of people put a lot of time into, I should obviously invest time learning how to use it. And maybe after doing that, I should explain to people how to use it. Um, I do have a video on it. And there's also a little question mark icon one can click on and get to the I have tried the question mark icon um, um, as well. As I say, it might just, you know, I, I think this often happens with APL stuff. I often hit things and I feel like maybe I'm not smart enough to understand this. Um, <laughs> Clearly, don't think that's uh, if if you yeah. think that's wrong. <laughs> we we uh, we we humbly disagree. But, yeah, <laughs> I do recall you saying a few minutes ago that you managed to teach your you know four year old daughter like twelve grade or age twelve algebra. <laughs> oh, no, I didn't. I just gave her the app. Right? It's like it's you sh it. it uh, I've heard other parents are giving it to their kids. They all seem to handle it. It's it's just this fun game where you hatch dragon eggs by like dragging things around on the iPad screen. And it just, it so happens that the things you're doing with dragon's eggs are the rules of algebra. And after a while, it starts to switch out some of the like monsters with symbols like X and Y, you know, and it does it gradually, gradually. And at the end, it's like, oh, now you're doing algebra. So I can't get any credit for that. That's uh, some very, very clever people uh, wrote a very it, cool it thing. It really is an amazing program. I, I homeschooled my son as well, and we used that for algebra. Great. And yeah. It was a bit more age appropriate, but it's I, I I looked at that and said that that really is well put together. It's it's an yeah. amazing program. Yeah. I will say maybe also there'll too. be a Dragon Box APO one day. <laughs> hey, that's not a bad idea. Not uh, a bad idea yeah. at all. I was going to say, when you're teaching somebody, one of the big challenges when you're sort of trying to get a language across to a general audience is who is the audience? Because as you say, if you're, mm. if you're dealing with uh, kids or people who haven't been exposed to programming before, that's a very different audience than somebody might have been exposed to some other type of programming. Functional programming is a bit closer, but if you're procedural programmer, imperative programmer, it's going to be a stretch to try and bend your mind in the different ways that you know, APL or J or BQN expect you to think about things. Yeah, I think the huge rise of functional programming is very helpful for coming to array programming, you know, um, both in JavaScript and in Python. It's, you know, I think most people are doing stuff, particularly in the, in the machine learning and deep learning world are doing a lot of functional stuff. Um, often that's the only way you can do things particularly in deep learning. Um, so I think, yeah, I think that does help a lot. Like, like Connor said, like you've probably come across, you know, map and reduce and filter and, and certainly in, um, in Python, you'll have done list comprehensions and dictionary comprehensions. Um, and a lot of people have done SQL. Um, so it's, yeah, I think a lot of people come into it with some relevant analogies if we can help connect it for them. Yeah, what, one of the things that, you know, this is really it's reinforcing the, um, my idea that, or it's not my idea, I think it's just an idea that multiple people have had, but that the tool doesn't exist yet. Because um, we'll link to some documentation that I use frequently when I'm going sometimes between APL and J on the BQM website, they have BQN to dialog APL dictionaries and BQN to J dictionary. So sometimes I'll like, if I'm trying to convert between the two, the BQN docs are so good, I'll just use BQN as like an IR uh, to go back and forth. But I've mentioned on previous podcasts that really what would be amazing, and it, it would only work to a certain extent, is something uh, like a, a multi-directional array language transpiler. And adding NumPy to that list would probably be, you know, uh, a, a huge... I don't know what the word for it is, but beneficial for the array community. If you can type in some NumPy expression, you know, like I said, it's only going to work to an, ex an extent, but for simple, you know, rank one vectors or arrays um, that you're just reversing and summing and doing simple, you know, reduction and scan operations, you could translate that pretty easily into APLJ and BQN. And it's, I think that would make it so much easier for people to understand AKA the hieroglyphics or the, the Greek or the Chinese or whatever <laughs> metaphor you want to use. Um, because yeah, this is, it is definitely challenging at times um, to get to a certain point where you have enough info to keep the snowball rolling, if you will. Um, and it's very easy to hit a wall early on. And, yeah. So that's a project I've 
been thinking about um, is basically rewrite NumPy in APL. It doesn't seem like a whole lot of work. Um, where just take all those names that are available in NumPy and just define them as APL functions. And people can explore that by opening them up and uh, and seeing how they're defined. Oh, so not not actually you're saying like, a, it wouldn't be a new thing. You're just saying like rename the symbols what they're known as in NumPy so that you'd still be in a, in a like an APL. Yeah, I mean, you could use it as a library, but I was thinking of it more as an, an interactive exploring type thing where you open up this library and then you you write the name of uh, some uh, numpy thing functionality and open it up in the editor and see well how is this defined in api and then you could use it obviously since it's defined interesting then you could slowly you could use these library functions and then as you get better at apl you can start actually writing out the, the raw apl instead of using these covers well, I guess, Jeremy, that's an interesting, do you think that, because you've mentioned about sort of the notation versus the programming language, and where do you think the, like, in your dream scenario, are you actually coding in sort of an Iversonian-like notation, or no. is it at the end of the day, does it still look like NumPy, but it's just all of the expressive, expressivity and power that you have in the uh, language like APL is brought to and combined with what NumPy sort of currently looks like is. I mean, well, it would be a bit of a combination, Connor, in that, like, you know, my classes and my type dispatch and my packaging and you know all the you know my function definitions and whatever that's that's Python. Um, but you know, it, it, everywhere I can use plus and times and divide and whatever, I could also use any um, any APO glyph, um, and so it'd be you know basically a, a, an embedded DSL for kind of high dimensional notation. It would work automatically on NumPy arrays and TensorFlow tensors and PyTorch tensors. Mm -hmm. I mean, one thing that's interesting is. To a large degree, APL and PyTorch and friends have actually arrived at a similar place with the same, you know, grandparents, which is Iverson actually said his um, inspiration for some of the APL ideas was tensor analysis. And a lot of the folks, as you can gather from the fact that in PyTorch, we don't call them arrays, we call them tensors. A lot of the folks working on deep learning, their inspiration was also from tensor analysis. So it comes from physics, right? And so I would say, you know, a lot more folks that worked on PyTorch were familiar with tensor analysis and physics than were familiar with APL. And so, and then of course, there's been um, other notations um, like explicitly based on Einstein notation. There's a thing called INOPS, which like takes, it's a very interesting kind of approach of taking Einstein notation much further and like Einstein notation if you think about it is the kind of the loop free programming of math right the the equivalent of loops in math is indices and Einstein mm -hmm. notation does away with indices um, and so that's why stuff like INOPS is incredibly powerful because you can write you know an expression in in, in INOPS with no indices and no loops and it's all implicit reductions and implicit loops. I guess, yeah, my ideal thing would be, we wouldn't have to use INOPS, we can use APO, you know, and it wouldn't be embedded in a string. It, it would, they would actually be operators. Yeah, that, that's what it is. There'd be operators in the language that Python operators would not just be plus times minus slash, but would be all the uh, um, APO glyphs would be Python, operators and they would work on all python data types including all the different tensor and array data types interesting yeah so it sounds like you're describing a kind of hybrid hybrid yeah. language javascript that... too i would love the whole dsl to be in javascript as well you know that'd be great and i feel like i saw that somewhere i feel like i saw somebody actually do an ecma script uh so, you know rfc with an implementation it was an April Fool's joke. 
Yeah, but it actually worked, didn't it? Like it's just, there was actually an implementation that. I don't think they had the implementation. It was just very, I mean, very read... well specced. It could actually work, kind of thing. No, I definitely. I read the. I read the code. I. Uh, it, there was. I don't know how complete it was, but there was definitely some code there. I can't find it again. We, um, if you know where it is. Um, there's an, there's some JavaScript implementation of APL by Nick Nikolov, um, but my problem with it, it's not tightly enough uh, connected with the underlying JavaScript. It's and it shouldn't be an April Fool's it. trick, should it? You know, it's like no, you know, it it's like <laughs> it's like Gmail was an April Fool's trick, right? Gmail came out on April the first and totally yeah. destroyed my plans for fast mail because it was an April Fool's trick that was real. Um, and Flask, you know, the Flask library, I think, was originally an April Fool's joke of like, you know, we basically saying we shouldn't be using frameworks because I've created a framework that's so stupidly small that it shouldn't be a framework. And now that's the most popular web framework in Python. So, yeah, maybe this should be an April Fool's joke that becomes real. How close, this is maybe an odd question, but um, because if, from what I know about Julia, you can define your own um, mm -hmm. Unicode operators. And I, I, I did try at one point to create a small uh, composition of two different symbols, you know, square root and reverse or something. And it ended up not working and asking me for parentheses. But uh, do, do you think Julia could evolve to be that kind of hybrid language that? Um... Yeah, maybe, you know, maybe. I'm actually doing a keynote at JuliaCon in a couple of weeks. So maybe I should. Uh... <laughs> Raise that. Yep. Um, Just uh, at the Q and A section, say uh, any questions. But first, I've got one for the community at large. Uh, here's what I'd like. I think my, you know, my whole talk is going to be kind of like what Julia needs to be, you know, to move to the next level. Uh, which I'm not sure I can demand that a complete APL implementation is that thing, but I could certainly <laughs> put it out there as something to consider. Well, it always bothers me though that if you touch it to extend those languages like this, or you could use some kind of pre-compiler for it, um, then their order of execution the, the ends up messing up APL. I think APL very much depends on having a strict one directional order of functions. Otherwise it's hopeless to keep track of. Uh, yeah, I mean, you'd have to like, that's, that is a big challenge because currently the DSL inside Python, which is the basic mathematical operations, do have the BODMAS or PEMDAS order operations. Um, so there would need to be some way. So in, in Python, that wouldn't be too hard actually, because in Python, you can uh, opt into different kind of parsing things by adding a from Dunder Futures import blah. So you could have a dot from Dunder Futures import APL precedence. And then from then on, everything in your file is going to use right to left precedence. That's really interesting and cool. I didn't know that. Yeah, I've, that been, spe awesome. I've been spending a lot of time thinking about um, function precedence and just the differences in different languages. And um, I'm not sure if any other languages have this, but it's something that I find very curious about BQN and APL is that they have functions basically that have higher precedence than other functions. So operators in APL and conjunctions and adverbs, they uh, have higher precedence than your regular functions that apply to arrays. You know, I'm simplifying right. a tiny bit, but this idea that like in, in, in Haskell, function application always has the highest precedence. You can never get anything that has a higher function precedence than that. And it always, having stumbled into the array world now, it's seems like a very powerful thing that these combinator like functions don't have just by default, the higher precedence, because if you have a fold or a scan or a map, you're always combining that with a, some kind of binary operation or unary operation to create another function that you're then going to eventually apply to something. And um, yeah. But this, the basic like right to left, you know, putting aside the, <clears throat> Uh, the, the higher order functions or operators mm -hmm. as they're known in APL, the basic right to left path. I mean, uh, again, for teaching and for my own brain, gosh, that's so much nicer than like in C++. Oh my God, the number of operator precedence. Yeah. There's no way I can ever remember that. And there's a good chance when I'm reading somebody else's code that, you know, they haven't used parentheses because they didn't really need them and that I have no idea where they have to go. And then I have to go and look it up. And 
you know, it's another of these things that with the kids, I'm like, okay, you remember that stuff we spent ages on about like, you know, first you do exponents and then you do times. And it's like, okay, you don't have to do any of that in APO. You just go right to left. And they're just like, oh, that's so much better. What is your, I, this literally came up at work like a month ago where I was giving this mini APL, like we had 10 minutes at the end of a meeting. And then I just made this offhand remark that of course, like the evaluation order in APL is a much simpler model than what we learned in school. And like, I upset, like there was, I don't know, 20 people in the meeting and it was the most controversial thing I had said. And like, and I, I almost had like an out of body experience because <laughs> I thought I was saying something that was like objectively just true. And then I was like, wait a second, what I'm clearly missed. Like, is there, yeah, well, you were something wrong. Like, how do you communicate? No, I mean, ad most adults are incapable of like new ideas. It's just, it's, it's sad. <laughs> That's what I should have said a, in the meeting. <laughs> it's a, it's a, <laughs> What I mean, this is a reason that I another reason I like doing things like APL study groups, because it's a way of like self selecting that small group of humanity who's actually interested in trying new things, despite the fact that they're grown ups and then try to surround myself with those people in my life. But isn't it sad then? I mean, what has happened to those grown ups? Like when you mentioned teaching these people and trying to like map their existing knowledge onto APL things, what does it mean to box and so on? I find that to children and non programmers, uh, explaining the array model and, and how the functions are applied and so on is almost trivial, meets no resistance at all. And it's all those adults that have either learned their, their PEMDAS or BOTMAS or whatever the, the rules are and, and all the computer science people that know their precedence tables and their lists of lists and so on. Those are the ones that are really, really struggling. It's not res just resisting. They're clearly struggling. They're really trying and, 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 it's a lot of effort. So well, there, we there is actually, I mean, that is a known thing in educational research. Um, so yeah, I mean, so I spent months earlier this year and late last year reading every paper I could about, you know, um, education because I thought if I'm going to be homeschooling, then I should try to know what I'm doing. And yeah, what you describe it um, is, is absolutely a thing, which is that that, um, you know, the research shows that trying, you know, when you've got a, you know, an existing idea, which is a, 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 an incorrect understanding of something and you're trying to replace it with a correct understanding, that is much harder than learning the correct version directly. So, which is obviously a challenge when you think about analogies An analogy has to be good enough to lead directly to the, to the correct version. Um, but I think, you know, the important thing is to find the people who, are, who have the curiosity and tenacity to be prepared to go over that hurdle, even though it's difficult, you know, because, yeah, it is like that's just that's just how human brains are. So so be it, you know. Yeah, unlearning is really hard work, actually. And if you think hmm. about it, it probably should be because you spend a lot of time and energy to put some kind of a pattern into your brain. Right. You don't want to have that evaporate very quickly right and our you know myelination occurs around what like ages eight to 12 or something so like our our brains are literally trying to stop us from having to learn <laughs> new things because our brains think that they've got stuff sorted out at that point and so they should focus on keeping long-term memories around so yeah it does become harder but you know a little bit it's still totally doable the solution is obvious teach ap on primary school <laughs> that's what i'm doing kind of <laughs> what was the word you mentioned a mile myelation My, myelination m-e-y-l-i-n-a-t-i-o-n -E interesting i had not heard that word before so it's a physical coating that i can't remember goes on the dendrites or something i think it's on the yeah. axons isn't it Excellent. It's, that's yeah, right. the, the, you get these the fat layers or, or, yeah. or yeah. Um, cholesterol layers yeah I never took any biology courses in my education, so clearly I've uh, I've missed out on that aspect. Um, you you myelinate you myelinated anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that an APL function? Myelinate. Oh, I don't think so. <laughs> you also mentioned the word tenacity, Jeffrey. Jeffrey yeah. And and um, and I was watching an interview you did with uh, Samyan Batani. Ah, uh, uh, yeah. And you were talking about because. It sounds like he was you. You spotted at, a, at an early point in his 
working with Kaggle that he was something probably different. And the thing you said was the tenacity to, to keep working at something. Yeah. Um, I think that's a really important part about educating people that they shouldn't oh, yeah. necessarily expect learning something new to be easy. Yeah. But you can do it. Oh yeah. I, I mean, I really noticed that when I was started learning Chinese, like I, I um, went to a, you know, just some local class um, in, in Melbourne and everybody was very, very enthusiastic, you know, and everybody was going to learn Chinese. Um, and we all talked about the things we were going to do. And yeah, each week there'd be fewer and fewer people there. <laughs> and, you know, I kind of tried to keep in touch with them, but after a year, every single other person had given up and I was the only one still doing it. And, you know, so then after a couple of years, people would be like, wow, you're so smart. You learn Chinese. And this is like, no, man, like during those first few weeks, I, I was pretty sure I was learning more slowly than the other students. Um, but everybody else stopped doing it. So of course they didn't learn Chinese. <laughs> and I don't know what the trick is because yeah, it's the same thing with, you know, like at fast AI courses, they're really designed to keep people interested and get people doing fun stuff from, from day one. And, but, you know, still, I'd say most people drop out. And the ones that don't, I would say most of them end up becoming like actual world-class practitioners and they, you know, build new products and startups and whatever else. And people will be like, oh, I wish I knew neural nets and deep learning. So it's like, okay, <laughs> here's the course. Just just do it and don't give up. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Tenacity, it's not a very common virtue, I think, for some reason. It's something I've heard, I think it's Joe Bowler at Stanford talk about the growth mindset. And I think that is something that, it, for whatever reason, some people tend to, and maybe it's myelination, at, at those ages, you start to get that mindset where you're not so concerned about having something happen that's easy to do well, but just the fact that if you keep working at it, you will get it. And not everybody, I guess, is maybe put in the situations that they they get that feedback that tells you, if I keep trying this, I'll get it. They, yeah. If it's not easy, they stop. Yeah, I mean, that, that area of growth mindset's a very controversial idea in education. Um, specifically the question of can you can you modify it? And I think it's certainly pretty well established at this point that the kind of stuff that schools have tended to do, which is put posters up around the place saying like, you know, make things a learning opportunity or don't give up, like they do nothing at all. Um, you know, with my daughter, we do all kinds of stuff around this. Um, so we've actually invented a whole family of clams. And as you can imagine, clams don't have a growth mindset. They tend to sit on the bottom of the ocean, not moving. And so the family of clams that we invented that we live with, you know, or, you know, always at every point that we're going to have to like learn something new or try something new, always start screaming and don't want to have anything to do with it. And, you know, so we actually have Claire telling the clams how it's going to be okay. And, you know, it's actually a good thing to learn new things. And so we're trying stuff like that to try to like have, have imaginary creatures that don't have a growth mindset and for her to realize how, how silly that is, but uh, even which is in the, fun. And the things that you were talking about in terms of the, the meta -mat mathematics, you didn't say, yeah. oh, the successor, this is what plus is. You said, how do you, how do you, how would you use this? How would you yeah, they start sure. to have to put it together themselves? Which to me, that's uh -huh. the growth mindset that if you, yeah, if you're creating that. But then like, you know, gosh, you're getting to all the most um, controversial things in education here, Bob, because that, so that's the other big one is um, discovery learning. So um, this idea of having kids explore and find um, it's also controversial because it turns out that actually the best way to have people understand something is to give them a good explanation. Um, so it is important like that you combine this like, okay, how would you do this with then like, okay, let me just tell you what, you know, why this is. It's easier for homeschooling with two kids because I can make sure their exploration is short and correct. You know, if you spend a whole class, you know, 50 minutes 
doing totally the wrong thing, then you end up with these really incorrect understandings, which you then have to kind of deprogram. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, education's hard, you know, um, and I think a lot of people look for these s simple shortcuts and they don't really exist. Uh, so you actually have to yeah, have good, good explanations and good problem solving methods and um, yeah, all this stuff. Um, it's a really yeah, interesting area, though. And the, the notations and the tools. Part of that. Yeah, and you know, notation. I mean, yeah. So I, I do a um, live coding, you know, video thing every day with a bunch of folks. And um, in the most recent one, we we started talking about APL and why we're going to be doing APL this week instead. And I gave you know somebody actually said like, oh my god, is it going to be like regexes? And, you know, I kind of said like, okay, so regexes are a, are a notation for doing stuff. And we spent an hour solving a problem with regexes. Um, and, oh my God, it was such a powerful tool for this problem. And, and you know, and by the end of it, they were all like, okay, we want to like deeply study regexes. And obviously that's a much less flexible and powerful tool notation than APL, but you know, we kind of talked about how once you start understanding these notations, you can build things on top of them and then you kind of create these abstractions. And that's yeah, notation is how you know deep human thought kind of progresses, right? In a lot of ways. Um, so, you know, it's like I, I actually spoke to a math professor friend a couple of months ago about, you know, my renewed interest in APL. And he, he was like, and I kind of sent him some, I can't remember what it was, maybe doing the golden ratio or something, little snippet. And he was just like, yeah, something like that looks like Greek to me. I don't understand that. It's like, like dude, you're a math professor. <laughs> you know, like if, if I said somebody who isn't in math, like a page of your, you know, <laughs> research what are they going to say <laughs> and uh, you know it's interesting i said like there's you know there are ideas in here like ivers and brackets for example have you ever heard of ivers and brackets and he's like well of course i've heard of it like you know it's a fundamental tool in math it's like well you know that's one thing that you guys have stolen from apl you know that's a powerful thing right it's like fantastic i'd never want to do without ivers and brackets so i kind of tried to say like okay well imagine like every other glyph that you don't understand here has some rich thing like Ivers and Brackets you could now learn about. Like, mm, okay, maybe I should give it a go. <laughs> I'm not sure he has. Um, but I think that's a, that was a good example for mathematicians is to show like here's one thing at least that found its way from APL that maybe gives you a sense that for a mathematician that there might be something in here. On that note, because I know we are potentially well, we've gone way over, but this has been awesome. Uh, but but a question I think that might be a good question to end on um, is, is, do you have any advice for folks that uh, want to learn something, whether it's Chinese or an array language or to get through your fast AI course? And is, is there, because I think, you know, like you said, you like to self-select for folks that are the curious types and that are want to learn new things and new ways to solve things. Um, but like, is there any way other than just being tenacious to like be tenacious? Is, is there tips to, you know, approaching something with some angle? Because I, I think a lot of the folks maybe listening to this uh, don't have that issue, but I definitely know a ton of people that are the, are the kind of folks that, you know, they'll join a study group, but then three weeks in, they, you know, they kind of lose interest or, or they decide it's too much work or, or too difficult. Um, as an educator, and, you know, it seems like you operate uh, in this space. Do you have advice to tell folks, you know? I mean, so much, Connor. Um, I, I actually kind of embedded in my courses a lot. Um, I can give you some quick summaries, but what I will say is, my friend Rada Kosmowski, who's been taking my courses for like four years, has taken everything I've said and his experience of those things and turned it into a book 
so if you um, read uh, Osmowski's book is called Meta Learning, uh, Powerful Mental Models for Deep Learning. Uh, this is learning as in learning deeply. Um, so yeah, check out his book um, to get the full answer. I mean, there's just, gosh, there's a lot of things you can do to make learning easier. Um, you know, and, and a key thing I do in my courses is I always teach top down. So like often people with like, let's take deep learning and neural networks, they'll be like, okay, well, first I'm gonna to have to learn linear algebra and calculus and blah, blah, blah. And you know, four or five years later, they still haven't actually trained a neural network. Um, our, our, our approach in our course is in lesson one, the very first thing you do in the first 15 minutes is you train a neural network. And um, it is more like um, uh, how we learn baseball or how we learn music, you know, like you say, like, okay, well, let's play baseball. Come, you stand there, you stand there. I've thrown this to you. You're going to hit it. You're going to run. You know, you don't start by learning, you know, the parabolic trajectory of a ball or the, you know, history of the game or whatever. You just start playing. So that's, you know, you want to be playing. Uh, and if you're doing stuff from the start that's fun and interesting and useful, then top down doesn't mean it's shallow. You can then work from there to like then understand like what's each line of code doing and then how is it doing it and then why is it doing it and then what happens if we do it a different way and until eventually with, with our fast AI program, you actually end up rewriting your own neural network library from scratch which means you have to very deeply understand every single part of it. And then we start reading research papers and then we start learning about how to implement those research papers in the library we just wrote. So yeah, I'd say go top down, make it fun, make it applied. Um, for things like APL or Chinese, where there's just stuff you have to remember, um, use Anki, use repetitive space learning. Um, you know, that's been around, Ebbinghaus came up with that, I don't know what, 200, 150, 200 years ago, it, it, it works, you know, you, you, um, everybody, if you tell them something, will forget it in a week's time, everybody, you know, and so you shouldn't expect to read something and remember it because you're human and humans don't do that. Uh, so uh, repetitive space learning will have you quiz you on that thing tomorrow and then in four days time, and then in 14 days time, and then in three weeks time. And if you ever forget it, it will reset that schedule and it'll make sure it's impossible to forget it. You know, So it's, it's depressing to study things that then disappear. And so it's important to recognize that unless you use Anki or Super Memo or something like that, uh, unless you use it every day, it will, it will disappear. But if you do use repetitive space learning, it, it's guaranteed not to. And I, I told this to my daughter a couple of years ago. I said, I, I, you know, what if I told you there was a way you can guarantee to never, ever forget something you want to know? It's just like, that's impossible. Is this like some kind of magic? It's like, no, it's not magic. And like, I, I, I sat down and I drew out the Ebbinghaus forgetting curves and explained how it works. Um, and I explained how, you know, if you get quizzed on it in these schedules, uh, it flattens out. And she was just like, and I was just like, what do you think? I was like, oh, I want to use that. So she's been using Anki ever since. Um, so maybe those are just two. Let's just start with those two. Yeah, so go top down and, uh, and use Anki, I think could make your learning process much more fulfilling because you'll be doing stuff with what you're learning and you'll be remembering it. Well, that is awesome. And yeah, definitely we'll leave links to not just Anki and the book Meta Learning, but um, uh, everything that we've discussed throughout this conversation, because I think there's a ton of really, really awesome advice. Um, and obviously to your fast AI course in the library. Um, and we'll also link to, I know you've been on, um, a like a, we mentioned before, a ton of other podcasts and talks. So if you'd like to hear uh, more from Jeremy, there's a ton of resources online. Hopefully it sounds like you're going to be, you know, building some learning materials uh, over the next however many months or years. And so in the future, if, if you'd love to come back and update us on, on your awesome. journey with the array languages, that would be um, 
yeah, super fun for us because I've I've thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. And thank you so That's much for of... waking up early all on the other way side of the world from us, at least uh, in Australia. Thanks for having me. And um, yeah, I guess with that, we'll say uh, happy array programming. Happy, happy array programming. programming. <laughs>